Turn with me to the book of Genesis in the Old Testament, chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50, and we will be reading beginning at verse 15, verse 21. Now, in the bulletin last Lord's Day, I had uh, encouraged you to read Psalm 139, but of course, that was in anticipation of actually completing the sermon last Lord's Day. So, uh, keep 139, Psalm 139 in your mind for next Lord's Day, plus Deuteronomy 7, and I think we'll all do well <laughs> to do that. So Genesis 50, verse 15, beginning there and reading through verse 21, God's word. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face and they said, behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. That is God's word to verse 21. And now we turn to Romans chapter 8 once again. Romans 8, and we will just take up the one verse, Romans 8, 28. Again, this is God's word. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Congregation of the Lord, you've heard the Lord's word from Genesis 50, from Romans 8. If you've heard and received it as his very word, confess that, that with me now by saying, Amen. You may be seated. Well, let us now ask for the Lord's blessing as we seek to understand and apply his word. We come, our Heavenly Father, and would plead that you might have mercy upon us, even as Joseph's brothers begged for mercy, ours of a different kind, that you might help us to understand and rightly apply your word. For we would confess before you that our hearts are, as your word teaches us, deceitful. May we be willing to joyfully submit to what your word teaches and to do so for your glory and for our good. We ask in the name of our Savior. Amen. Well, as the bulletin notes here, that's a pretty bare outline. Uh, that's, you may recognize part of it from last Lord's Day. Well, it really should, I suppose, in God's providential ordering of things be taken separately, this verse, but it is really building on what we saw last Lord's Day, I trust. But before we uh, begin to look at this verse more particularly, I do want to point out something to you, and that is how important definitions are. Now, you might have been bored in elementary school with a lot of the exercises uh, that you had to do. I certainly was. Um, I think uh, my parents and my teachers would testify how lazy I was as a student and how awful I was as a student. And I was bored to tears. Oh, grammar, arithmetic. History, that was fun. Most of everything else was tedious. Definitions. Ugh. But you know that if you've ever taken another language that is not your own, definitions can be very important. In fact, one of the first things you do is you get a vocabulary list. Here, learn these. It was true with Greek, and it was true with Hebrew, and it's true with every other language that you seek to speak. It's necessary. Definitions 
are necessary and they're very important. Now, in case the thought hasn't already occurred to you, we know how important it is even in our day, isn't it? Have there been definitions of English words that have changed over the last few years, perhaps? What about marriage? Hmm. (laughs) What about good? What about evil? Well, there's a reason for that. And the reason for this, uh, I, I would contend, demonic change in the definitions of words is because words are important. We think in words. We think in concepts that are formed by words. Now, you may wonder at some point here why I'm spending so much time speaking about this. Well, it's because definitions are really important when it comes to understanding God's Word. Now, we have to be careful to not superimpose a modern understanding of a word in an ancient understanding of the word and come up with some novel interpretation. That happens all the time, by the way. But seeking to understand what God's word means when it was written, inspired the Holy Spirit, applying it to today is very important. It's important for the text that we have. I've already mentioned in passing one example of that. What is evil? What is good? What is righteous? What is upright? What is unrighteous? There are certain places where you can go today where your definitions would be 180 degrees out of phase with the people that you're speaking to. We know that all things work together for good. Work together for good. Now, that's a pretty plain and straightforward English sentence, isn't it? The grammar's not tough in the English or the Greek, as it happens. It's an important text for us because of the simplicity of it. It's an important text because, in a sense, Paul is wrapping up all of the that he said for quite a bit of what he's written here in these words. And we know that all things work together for good. That is, as I have in the outline here, the providential ordering of all things. Now here's our first definition. What is What do I mean by providential? See, within the context of the church that you're in right now and the denomination of which this church is a part and our fraternal denominations, when we talk about God's providence, that is a term of art, we might say, that help, that we use as a shorthand to describe something. But what does that mean? The name of this church is Providence Reformed Church. We love providence. We love the concept of the providential care, the providential ordering, the providential working of God. What does that mean? Well, sometimes when we talk about providence, And the providential ordering of all things, we get it a little bit confused with other concepts that are true in the scriptures, but we need to be clear here. The providential ordering of things is God's working out in time and in history in the outworking of his sovereign decree before there was time and history. That's one way that we can define it. That is... We talk about, for example, God's election. We talk about foreordination and all of these things. Well, how is it then that God calls the elect unto himself, the elect which are spoken of later in this verse? How does he do that? He does it by the providential ordering of all things. See, I suspect your experience is similar to my experience, that there was somebody that came along in my life, that God sent along in my life, and he said the things that I needed to hear that moved me to this place. And then there was an event over here that caused me to move to this place. God ordering those things and understanding that helps us to understand what's being spoken of here, even though the word's not used particularly in this verse. So when I speak about the providential ordering of things, I'm talking about God's control, God's ordering of all those things that happen. Even brothers selling their snot-nosed little brat brother into slavery, like we read in Genesis. Even that. Now, you know and I know that 
all things work together for good. What is good? What is good? Well, there's a lot of ways that we can talk about good. We can talk about, that was a really good enchilada. It might be a really good enchilada. Is that the same thing as saying that something is a spiritual good, a moral good, an eternal good? Well, you need to eat, yes? And in fact, the enchilada might be the only thing that's available for you to eat right now. And as you're hungry, as you need food in order to survive, that's a good thing, yes. Assuming it's prepared correctly and that the meat was not spoiled and assuming that there's not some other kind of food poisoning, you understand what I'm saying here. So there's a good and then maybe a not so good that comes from the good things. When we start talking about things like good, when we start talking about things like evil, when we start talking about God's providential ordering of things, all of a sudden it doesn't seem so straightforward all the time. And we have an example of that in Genesis 50. If you think back on what we read, what was it exactly that happened? Well, we know the story, I trust. You know the story. Children in Sunday school are taught the story about Joseph and his brothers What is Joseph's interpretation? Well, Joseph's interpretation is very plain. You meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Now, was it evil that his brothers sold him into slavery? In case you're struggling with that, I'll give you a hint. The answer is yes. Yes, it was evil. Not only was it evil that they sold him into slavery, if you recall, they deceived his father into thinking that he was dead. So they sinned not only against Joseph, but they sinned against their father. And yet Joseph says, God meant this for good. How is it good? Well, as it happens, Joseph, by being where he was, as you know, saved who who knows how many lives of Egyptians and of his own family. He says that explicitly there at the end of what we read. So what was good? What was evil? Was it good that he was sold into slavery? Again, without qualification, we can say no, it was evil. It was meant for evil. You see, there are things that we need and things that are necessary, and they can be good. There are things that are spiritual that are good. There are things that are necessary and that are spiritual. And then there are things that are spiritual that are evil. But what is spoken of here, particularly in our text, that thing that that you know, what is good? I'm glad you asked. What is notable here, like much of, here we go, talking about definitions in Greek, uh, if you were to grab a lexicon or something like that, you would note that there are a number of words that are translated good in the New Testament. Completely unrelated words. Words And this is one feature of Greek that is very helpful if you're doing study in the scriptures or preparing a sermon as it happens. And each one means something different. Now this particular word here means something that is useful, something that is healthful for you, something that is agreeable, something that is joyful, happy, something that is good in the sense of being upright or honorable. I hope you get a sense here, and it can speak about things that are either material or in the moral realm. So in that sense, it's a very broad term. Well, that's interesting, I suppose, in itself, if you're particularly interested in those kinds of things. But the important point is how it contrasts with the other words, the words that were not chosen. Now, one of the questions that our brother, David Wojtek, was asked at his licensure exam Thursday had to do about the inspiration of the scriptures. And that was, do you believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of the scriptures? Meaning, do you believe that every single word is inspired in the scriptures? Every single word. And his answer was excellent. He said, yes, every single word, every single letter is inspired by God and therefore is authoritative. So the fact that this word is chosen is on purpose. Because there are other words that could have been used 
For example, we can refer to something that is beautiful, right? If you see a work of art that is particularly beautiful, a painting or other something, and you say that is an excellent, that's an excellent rendering of that scene or that whatever it might be. That is some of the most skillful use of color I have ever seen. And if you've ever seen master works, especially the older masters, you've seen those kinds of paintings. It's stunning in person to see them. It's stunning. It's good. It's excellent. But it's not a moral good. It's that word is not used. And in fact, it makes sense because there are times when, as in the life of Joseph, it wasn't a good. It was actually positively an evil, and God turned it to good. If you're wondering how this word is used, you can look at Romans chapter 7, verse 16. It may be right there on the page. Romans 7, 16, If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. It's good. It's right. It's a beautiful thing. It's a, it's a thing to be admired. It's also a moral good as it happens. And there's another word that is translated good, and that is one that talks about something that's fit for use, something that is good. For example, if you need to use a screwdriver, the hammer is not going to do it, contrary to what some people may try. A screwdriver is good for driving screws. A hammer is good for driving nails. Not particularly good for swatting flies. Something that has, something that is needful for a particular use. Something that is mentioned, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, where the apostle advises his readers to not be deceived that evil company corrupts good habits. That is useful habits. Behaving yourself is a good thing. Not being offensive is a good thing. So what is being spoken of here? Well, particularly the word, if I might uh, refresh your memory here, is speaking about those things which are particularly the idea of it being salutary, good, healthful to you. Now this really puts it in the right context, doesn't it? You know, notoriously, since I've already revealed to you my awful nature in my youth, I was very young and I had to go to the doctor for a particular skin problem that I had when I was very young and the doctor says, well, this is in chewable form or it's the kind that you can swallow. And me thinking I'm the big boy, I said, I'm going to have the swallow kind. Well, I couldn't swallow them. It tasted nasty. It was awful. These little pills, were just, I mean, put it on my tongue and it was awful. So what do you think I did? Did I take the, the pill? No. I went and hid and said I took the pill and I threw it in the garbage can. That's what I did. That is the thing that was despicable to me, that I hated, I rejected. Of course, my parents found the pills and I suffered the consequences, but that's a completely different story. Nevertheless, what I'm saying really does apply here. The providence of God might be that little pill that is necessary for your health. And it tastes awful. So much so that you want to spit it out. Have you ever endured something? Something in your life as a Christian, something that in your life uh, with other people, something you had to endure physically, mentally, spiritually, those kinds of things, and you hated every moment of it, even though you can understand now, perhaps years later, how good that was for you. How good that was for you. See, this is the kind of good that is being spoken of here, that the triune God of heaven and earth works out in the little details of your life, ultimately for your good and his glory. So when he says, and we know that all things work together for good, 
that doesn't mean that right now we necessarily understand it. In fact, I would submit to you that most of the time we don't understand it. Now, one of the things they teach you in seminary is to avoid using pronouns like we. What I would should say is you. You should know this. I'm using we on purpose. <laughs> I need to know this. You need to know this. Really know this. Because these things work together to sanctify you. These things work together to strengthen you. What appears to weaken you for a time is, those, is that thing that actually helps. You might say, well, what about, what about my own sins? What about, what about those things that are unjust that maybe happened to me? Somebody at work lied about me and I ended up losing my job because of someone's lies or some other such thing. Is that good for me? Well, I, we could always look at verse 28 and see what the answer is. That's one option. All things. All things. Even the sin of others. Even the sin of others. Now, just so we understand that I'm not making uh, too much of a reach here, isn't that what the Apostle Peter says in his sermon in Acts? Of course, in the first sermon, just like Joseph, they meant it for evil, and God meant it for good. The arch crime of history, murdering the sinless Son of God, even the evil things, even your own sin, if you're a child of God, is worked to your own good. Now, is there a danger in this? Is there a danger in understanding that even my own sins, even my own weakness, God ultimately turns to my good? You better believe there is. You better believe there is. Is there a danger in holding holding tenaciously to the doctrine of election? Is there a danger in that? In God's sovereign election? Yes, if what you learn by that is, well, I don't need to ever speak about Jesus Christ because God's going to do it all on his own, without means. If that means that, well, I guess I'm elect, it doesn't really matter what I do and don't do. If that's your interpretation of that doctrine, yes, there's a danger there. That's not just me saying that. Read the canons of Dort. It's very clear that danger exists. Does that mean that we ought not to seek righteousness in the public square? That is, when we have the ability and the opportunity in the public square that we can affect things for good and to put aside the evil? Is that something we ought to do? Yes, we ought to do that. But even the evil that's around us ultimately serves God's purpose. Well, how then? Right? How does that happen? Well, in case you haven't noticed lately, especially in our own time and in our own circumstances in our country, and especially where we live here in this state, is it getting harder and harder to profess Christ in the public square? Is it getting harder and harder to live a Christian life, especially if your job is in the corporate world? When it comes down to the nitty-gritty that the, your employer requires you to lie, requires you to lie, requires you to deny what you know the Scriptures teach about the created order, does that have an effect on you and your Christian life, the decision that you make at that point? Is that for your good or is it for not for your good? Does it make you ask the right questions? Does it make you seek the right answers? So this isn't just something that's in the sky, not something that's out there in the ether somewhere. It touches us in every part of our lives.
So even the evil that's in the world, even the evil that you confront is ultimately for your good. And certainly the life of the Savior is the primary example of that. Let's understand, it doesn't mean that evil is not evil, it is evil. But what it means is that it's not outside of God's control. That shouldn't give you an encouragement to sin. It shouldn't give you an encouragement to not strive and to fight. But whatever is done, whatever schemes of evil men and women, whatever schemes that the enemies of the gospel may hatch, is the kingdom shaken? Is your eternal reward shaken by that? What do we read in Psalm 2? Oh, the princes, they, they hate Messiah. They hate the Lord's anointed. They would seek to throw off his chains, as it were, perceiving them as change. And what does the Lord say? The Lord laughs at them. Laughs at how puny it is, how ineffectual it is. How many evil ones have arisen in the history of the world, especially since the revelation of Messiah? How many evil have raised up and sought to destroy the church? How many? For me, it's innumerable, right? How many in secret? How many that it never makes the history books? Of course, they're the notorious ones, of course. How many have sought to undermine the gospel, the message of the gospel, both in and outside of the church? And yet, today, this very day, not only here, but all over the world, congregations just like this are meeting together They're hearing the gospel preached. They're hearing the word read. They're singing the praises of Messiah, Lord Jesus Christ. And they're doing so with hope and confidence that even if the evil were to arise, even if the evil were to come into this place right now, that none of that would hinder the growth and the advance of the kingdom. So what, in fact, is this good? What is this good? It says that all things work together for this good and that we know this. Well, let me put a little different spin on that. One of the things that we know here is that we often don't know. So that's what's so important about this. We know these things. Yes, we do know these things, but right now, at this very moment, what is it in your life that you're thinking, what in the world does God have in mind here? Why? 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 (laughs) The great question, why? Why this physical trial? Why this spiritual trial? Why Why this economic trial? Why, why, why? Well, the answer may not come in this life. It may. You may see with clearer eyes some time down the road, but the answer is, well, can't answer the why, but you know that God means it for your good and his glory. But pastor, it hurts. It hurts. And scriptures don't deny that. Scriptures don't deny that. See, the promise here is such a glorious one because the fact is that you and I, we live in a fallen world. We live in a world in which the effects of sin are ongoing. That's going to change. It's going to change in you personally. It's going to change broadly at some point. But you and I, we live in a fallen world. We have fallen natures. We sin. Those around us sin. Often the pain that we endure is because of the sin. Even the physical infirmities that we have are of the corruption of Adam. which, of course, follows sin. And so the promise here, while not 
proposing to answer all questions, certainly not in the particular, is that we know right now, right at this very moment, that all things work together for good, for that which is healthful, that which is needful for you. And so as our confession says, whether in prosperity, whether in want, whether in health or in sickness, all of those things, right? All of those things come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Well, now, who is it that is being spoken of here? Well, interestingly, at least it is to me, that this promise and this knowledge that we know that all things work together for good are what? To those who love God. Well, that narrows it down. (laughs) That narrows it down. You see, the promise is not given to humanity generally. The promise to humanity generally is that the Lord is victorious. Christ is king. That's the promise. And Christ is coming. That's the promise. And all things will be judged and all things will be made right. That's the promise to the world generally here. And for a world in darkness, for a person who has not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's really bad news. But the good news, the gospel is that if you trust him, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, if if you cry out to God for mercy and salvation, confessing your sins, then the promise is to you those who love God. And of course, that means the work of the Holy Spirit in that one, because the love of God is not natural to humanity. And if you wonder about that, go all the way back to chapter one, chapter two of Romans. The love of God, the love of neighbor is not natural in our fallen state. So for the apostle here to say those who love God is a way of saying, in an indirect way, those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have had the work of regeneration in them by God's sovereign and providential working of all things. That is, they've moved from this condition of being darkness into light, this condition of being a rebel into a loyal citizen. That one that was an enemy is now, as we saw earlier, adopted into the household of God. You see, so this this promise, dear ones, is for you. It is for you. It is particularly for you. Now remember the context. I mentioned this last Lord's Day in talking about the groaning of creation and talking about the hope that we have and the hope that, that sometimes for us can seem so far away. All of these things come together to what Paul says here, that all things work together for good. Those who love God and are called accord, are the called according to his purpose. You see, here we see together, sort of melded together in the same verse, what I spoke of earlier the eternal purposes of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before the foundation of the world and that touching time and history and you, and not you only, but you, the church, more broadly speaking, in a very specific providential way. Those who are the called according to what? His purpose. His purpose. I want to just be patient here for a second. I'm going to take a little bit of a detour and we'll come back to that last phrase because it's the real exclamation point on what we're seeing here. But the first thing I want you to do now, just let's take a pause here, and I want you to know the assurance of what it is that we know. And there is no sense of conditionality here. It's not mere probability. We know that all things might work out okay. That's not a very comforting verse, if it were a verse. 
for those who belong to Jesus. There's no conditionality, no probability. We know that all things do, in fact, work out for good. So note what the good is. It is what is worked out. <laughs> it's what is worked out. That is, you may not see it now. In fact, it's likely that you won't see it now. It's not that the evil that you endure is good in itself. It's not. Evil is evil. That doesn't change in the light of God's providential working in time and history. And this is really important to grasp because suffering is real. Trials are real. This is not a denial of those things, but they are sanctified to us by the providential working of our sovereign God who has called his people and will bless his people. Now, what does that blessing look like? Well, when you look at the history of the world and the history of those who have especially suffered for the sake of the testimony of Jesus Christ, sometimes what that looks like is a dungeon and a stake. And that evil is turned to good. But here particularly, I said to be patient here, we're going to look at this last little phrase, according to his purpose. We're going to go back to definitions here. Now, if you engage in more uh, high-level conversations with people, if you like to do those things, and you start talking about purpose, people are going to get really uncomfortable. In fact, if you talk to a thinking atheist, and they do exist, by the way, and you start talking about a creation that has purpose, they are going to lose their minds because purpose implies accountability. We can't have accountability, you know, to a creator or any such thing. Therefore, the universe has to be a random universe. The universe has to simply have sprung up of its own. And if the universe just sprung up of its own, then you and I, we just sprung up out of the slime. And if that is true, then there is no purpose in this world. There's no particular point to it all. And therefore, that's why philosophy in the last, philosophy in the last hundred years has led to a place of absolute despair. Absolute despair. So much so that even the ultimate despair of suicide is now exalted, right? So you start talking about purpose. You're talking. You're you're taking a, a a needle and you're poking it right in the eye of modern day philosophy. They hate it. But for you and for me, it is one of the most comforting phrases that we find in the scriptures. Purpose. What is God's purpose? Well, in summary, we can say, and I've mentioned this already a couple of times, it's your good and his glory. Ultimately, even as we're going to see later in Romans, even the unbeliever, even the wicked serve the glory of God, unwillingly, of course, but they do so. But there's something that's going on here that I hope will encourage you greatly, and this is why I so desperately wanted to get to this place last Lord's Day. The word... Here, it's a compound word in the original. And it's a word that's used elsewhere. It's not used very often. And the typical sort of dictionary, lexical definition, it means the setting forth of a thing. Okay. That is, you demonstrate something or you, you set it forth. This is, this is what I intend to do. You may say, my purpose is, and then I'm going to go on a, a little vacation to Yosemite, right? I'm going to enjoy those things. That's my purpose is to go there and enjoy the waterfalls and the trees and try to not get irritated by the crowds. That's my purpose. Or you might say, my purpose is, and then fill in the blank, whatever that purpose is. And the idea here is that you have an internal motivation, an internal desire, 
And then that internal thing is demonstrated in a particular way. You get in your car and you go to Yosemite. And this idea, this concept of the internal concept that manifests itself outwardly being translated as purpose is notable in the other way in which this word is used. And that is in the New Testament, particularly, it's the word that is used to describe the showbread. The showbread. You're saying, what's the showbread, Pastor? The showbread is the loaves of bread, the 12 loaves of bread that were placed on the table in the holy place, in the tabernacle, and in the temple under the old covenant. I want you to think about that for just meditate on that for a second. I, because this is this is one of those little nuggets that you get out of scripture that is so encouraging. Why is this word used to talk about 12 loaves of bread? Every Sabbath day, the bread was renewed. It was fresh bread was brought in. Laid out in a very specific arrangement. There were two rows. Six and six, and all of these things were laid out, and it was visible. It was visible to the priests, particularly. What do the loaves represent? What is the thing signified by the loaves? It was God's outward manifestation of his purpose to provide for his people that which was necessary to sustain them. It also represents this union and communion that we have with God. The table is there in the holy place. It's a place where you would, under ordinary circumstances, take your meal. It represents that relationship that we have with our covenant God. And in particular, under the old covenant, this outward covenant community, full of sinners, And that loaf, those loaves, and I'm relying on a particular dictionary here that sort of took this on, and it's just so beautiful. They symbolize the fact that on the basis of the sacrificial atonement of the cross, believers are accepted before God and are nourished by him in the person of Christ. So all of the Old Testament system, all of the sacrificial system points where it points to Christ. It points to Christ. And the showbread that was laid out week by week, representing the the 12 tribes, sufficient for all of God's people. It was eaten by the priests as they represent the nation. Well, who are the priests in the new covenant? You and me. We partake of that bread not so much speaking of the sacrament, although the sacrament points in many ways to the same thing, but that showbread, God's purpose to provide, to nourish us, that we have peace and uh, unity with him and with one another, points to the Lord Jesus Christ, that living bread, the one who was given for each one of us. It's a way of God saying, these people are mine, and I will provide That is my purpose, and here is how I'm going to show my purpose. You see, purpose, if we come back now to the text particularly, purpose, purpose is the secret, we might say. Why, Lord? Why? The answer is purpose. Not a random purpose, not a purpose that is heartless or impersonal, but it is the divine purpose, God's purpose. And we might say, well, God, I don't understand. And the answer comes back, it is all for good to you because you love me. And we might say, and I love you, and it's according to my purpose, just like the showbread. Now, as we come to the end today, 
you may be thinking to yourself, well, I think I have more questions now than when I came into the room today. That may be true. And if you want absolute answers to your questions, I'm going to have to tell you that it's likely that you won't get them, not in this life. You might get partial answers. But for the Christian, that is sufficient because of God's purpose, because of the love that we have both to him and from him for his provision for us and the knowledge that we have that even in the midst of an evil world, God will turn all things to your good, even the wickedness of the most wicked and evil in this world. And to you, dear one, that ought to be a tremendous comfort. You who love God and belong to Jesus Christ. Amen.